Welcome to the Process Control webinar on useful but less known control chart methods. Our agenda is about 60 minutes long. We're going to go through the welcome and overview now. Uh, we're going to talk about how AS13100 and RM13006 work together on this, and then summary and conclude. There are three of us presenting today. I am Marnie Ham. I'm with GE Aerospace. I'm a consulting engineer in quality. I'll be followed by Steve Hampton from PCC, a process control manager, and Karen Scavato from Pratt & Whitney, technical fellow in statistics. All right, welcome. Glad you joined us. So just some ground rules here. This webinar is being recorded, so it can be archived on the AESQ website. We will have a question and answer section at the end. Um, so just to keep the noise volume low, we ask everyone to put their uh, computers, phones, whatever you're viewing this on, on mute, um, and we'll do the question and answer at the end. Thank you. Process control methods. We are the subject matter interest group, SMIG, which is in charge of writing RM13006, the gold book, and we support any changes in AS13100, the standard, that fit in the area of process control. So we are involved both in the manual writing for the RM and in the standard writing. So all of this is to support AS9100, AS9103, the variation management of key characteristics, and AS9145. We're good. Thank you. All right. So our subject matter expert group has provided multiple webinars this year. We are currently on the fourth webinar of the year with three more planned for the rest of the year. So you'll see in the bottom right all the different webinars we've done this year and the ones that are planned with the planned date for those webinars. Uh, you can still register for the ones that haven't come out yet. Um, and all the rest are available on the AESQ website um, under events. And if you want to know more about the interest groups, there's a link at the bottom there also to the interest groups so that you can be involved or hear about upcoming events there. So the SMIGs are made up of a series of subject matter experts from different AESQ member companies. Uh, and we're always looking for input from the people who use the resources. What is it you need from us? Uh, updates to the manual or webinar topics. We're always open to suggestions and comment. This is the subject matter interest group. So these are all the member companies from AESQ with the people in the process control methods group. So great looking group. We work a lot together. We're meeting weekly to keep updating and providing new resources. So how do you get help? So if you're going through something and you need help, here's the best ways to reach out, right? The first is to grab the supplemental material books off the AESQ website. We refer to them sometimes as the gold books. We also provide templates and tools in the same area of that supplemental materials. Additionally, we have a LinkedIn community of practice group. So questions, concerns, issues that you have, a change to the RM manual, go through the AESQ website. But like, if you have a question about something that you're reading and understanding, you can reach out through the LinkedIn group as well. Post a question there. We do all read what's going on there and respond to stuff. It's a great way to get involved. So here's the zero defects graphic. It's been around for a few years, but it really describes really well as to what AS13100 is all about, how do the different elements, the different subject matter interest groups fit in, how the different RM manuals all fit into it. So you can see we've circled in red the process control. So it's post-design, post-process development, right? If you're talking APQP, it's in that phase five APQP where, hey, we're now producing product. So that's where process control falls in best. Here's another different way it's, it's viewed, but similar idea, right? It's AS9145, the different, the five phases of it, where they fit in. And you can see we've highlighted the RM13006, which is a second level document through AESQ, one of our free manuals, and how it supports. So really it gets started in the phase three of APQP while developing the control plan. And then it flows right through to the end of the life of the product. And you can see AS13100, the primary level one, crosses absolutely everything. All right, again, reference to our website, the AESQ website. You can find all the supplemental materials under the supplemental material connection through the documents. 
This lists all the different subject matter expert groups that support and reference manuals that support AS 13100. So you can see a large number of them there. We have highlighted the process control methods, RM13006 in blue to try and help show that. And on the right is actually a snapshot from the website showing how the different SMIG groups are set up um, and their RM manuals and then the types of resources they have. So you can see some have more than others, including RM13006. We have not just the RM manual, we have four other supplemental materials there. All right, so now going, starting our webinar, useful but less known control methods. I'm going to cover the first one, the individual moving range and range chart. So it has both between and within variation. So this is what it looks like. It's got three graphics to represent the control chart. So the top one um, shows the average. So they call it an IMR. Uh, other places will call it X bar moving range range. So the first one is the average of your subset. That's the top graphic. The middle one is the within or sorry the between variation so between one subgroup and the next subgroup each time you pull the data and the bottom one is the within variation so that's where the moving range and range both come in place so positives for this it's a great graphic and a great control chart for showing both within variation and between variation so within your sample and between your samples so you can see that both ideally are getting to stability so we can see that stability within each pull of data we have plus between the polls. It's great for batch production. Um, I know I hear frequently that, you know, oh, we're aerospace, we make small volume, we don't ever have batches, but we do. They're just different size batches. Um, they're great for parts with lots of the same characteristics. So the part itself might be the characteristics. If we've got, um, I've seen examples where we have a thousand of the same characteristic with the same dimensional tolerances on it on a part, that's large, well, that's a great batch. The part itself could be the batch and we're looking inside that. Uh, it's a great chart to start with. If you're looking at a IMR chart, right? A standard individuals chart and you see over dispersion, i.e. lots of stuff outside your control limits, it might be a great way to look at it differently and say, hey, maybe I don't really have individuals data. I Maybe I have this between within. It's not suitable for all applications. That's the negatives. Um, it's not applicable when we are measuring every part and every feature and every characteristic. As I mentioned, the description is really good for looking at stability and control both within your subgroup and between your subgroups. Uh, very useful for batch production. Really useful uh, when we're setting up tools and then letting them run for a while. Each of those tool setups can be put in a chart like this and helps explain variation that might not be seen otherwise. Um, the R chart is that within group variation and the MR or the moving range is the between group variation. And then I've got the formulas down in the bottom right. Okay, next one. So I just made this a little bigger. This is an example, a whole radius where we have lots of parts and we're just measuring the first 10 parts out of the batch. So each batch is about a thousand parts in it. Um, so we're measuring the first 10, verifying that they are dimensionally good. And we're doing that before running multiple parts. And then we do this, I've shown six setups here. So we can start to see that we've got good control between our different setups. This same data plotted on an individual's chart, I didn't show that. Um, it shows like it's out of control because there's so much variation within those parts if you're not considering it as batching. All right, next chart. So I'm going to pass this off to Steve to talk about the CUSUM and the EWMA. Oh, thanks, Marnie. Appreciate that. Great job. Um, Hey everyone, we're going to talk about two charts uh, that are uh, similar in a lot of ways, uh, but they have a little bit of differences. Um, but the key thing you need to think about is uh, ARL, or average run length, because this is the way that we actually determine the performance of our EWA and QSUM. And that's a little bit different than our Shoehart charts that you're used to. You know, you just put them in place and then they do their thing. Um, but with the EWA and QSUM, we actually are going to end up tuning those to get a desired average run length uh, for the shift we're trying to detect. So what is average run length? Well, it's the number of runs on average it takes to detect an out of control run. And on the bottom right hand side, I have a normal distribution with three sigma limits. Um, 
and to kind of illustrate what I'm going to be saying. So for an in control, so that very bottom right distribution where we're, you know, nice and centered right on zero, uh, uh, our calculation of average run length is going to be one divided by the probability of an out of control signal. So for that in control population, uh, that's going to be one divided by 0 0.0027 because, you know, for a normal distribution, 99.73% uh, of that distribution is going to be within three sigma uh, plus or minus three sigma. And that gives us an average run length of 370. And we call this uh, an RLL, R, <laughs> ARL of zero, uh, which is just our baseline, which is saying that there's been no shift. Um, and so we would expect on average, it's going to take 370 uh, control like data points as we in our process to finally signal an out of control um, uh, point. And so, and ideally, if you are in control, that number would be infinite. So the bigger that number is, the better for us. Interestingly enough, when you start to add on your like electric uh, or Western electric rules, so if we were to turn on our zone rules, our AL, ARL zero uh, for uh, our Schuhart chart um, drops down to 109. So you really get penalized with false uh, signals when you start to turn on a lot more rules. So that's why you'll see the literature uh, discourage just turning on all those, uh, all those extra tests. Uh, and which is really nice by having uh, this additional control chart type because a lot of those tests are trying to sh detect shifts. And so these charts are really good at detecting shifts without giving you false signals. So uh, as we go to like an ARL one, so a mean shift of one standard deviation, uh, a standard Schuhart chart will detect that in 43.9 runs on average, a two sigma shift, 6.3, and a three sigma shift, two. So you can see that when we get a really big shift, the Schuhart charts do great. Uh, they'll detect it really fast. Um, but for anything that's below like one and a half sigma shift, it can take a while. And if it's critical to detect something, that's where these EWA and QSUM charts really shine. And you can see a tabulation of the different mean shifts and the ARLs for the different types of charts there. And also there's a little graph in the upper right hand corner. And that's where you can really see the, the power of these charts where, you know, they start above the shoe heart chart. Um, for an, our, our in control state and then rapidly drop down below it, you know, and uh, they finally kind of converge around that two sigma shift. So that's the power of these charts and that's why we want to talk about them. Next slide. So the first one uh, we'll talk about is QSUM. Uh, this, I'm using the jump software here. Um, the, the Marnie's previous example is showing a mini tab. Uh, both platforms can do any of the stuff we're talking about, uh, except for the percentile method that Karen will talk about. Um, you have to manually do that one. Uh, but uh, this is looking at a tabular uh, cumulus sum version. The old school is actually the uh, VMAS version. Um, so you might see VMAS reference in some things. But this is a chart that's really, uh, you know, trying to detect a small shift in your process uh, without giving false alarms. Uh, the two charts that you have there, um, have uh, on the upper left is our QSUM. It's the same exact data. So the target of the process is 100 degrees. Um, and we have a, you know, a standard deviation of 10 point, basically 11. And you can see that the QSUM chart has uh, readily identified the, the shift, whereas even with all eight tests turned on, so we've absolutely uh, set ourselves up for, for a lot of false alarms. So we're going to drive like our process control engineer or people on the floor crazy. And we still didn't detect the shift. So uh, that I think that's a great just visual of the power of, of the QSUM uh, chart. Um, you do need to be aware that uh, it works best with normally distributed data. And it can be really hard to interpret. You can see that this Y axis is not in data units anymore. It's in cumulative sums of uh, your deltas from your target. So that's always fun to explain to people. Uh, and as you'll see later on, since you can, it's a positive. You can just look at an upper shift or a lower shift. That's great. But that can actually even add some confusion when you have both of them on. And we'll see that a little bit later on. So um, on the um, 
Yeah, and so that's kind of the, the, the main positive and negatives. You go to the next slide. Here's the formulas. So this is also interesting, and this comes back to that these charts are different in that you need to tune them, is the lower control limit and the upper control limit are just whatever you want it to be. You get to choose those, uh, where the center line is the process mean or the target value. Uh, and then you have this K value, which is the smallest change of the mean that you want to detect in standard deviation units. So in jump, the default is 0.5, which is half a uh, sigma and shift and then um oh, sorry i'm going to mute someone real quick uh and then uh so you balance h and k with how you want an arl zero uh value to be and tar you're usually targeting above that 370 which is the baseline because that's the shoe heart so you want to be above 370 and then for like you know an arl of one if you're looking for a one sigma shift you try to get that to be as small as possible with this tuning um but you have this this uh, C plus, this cumulative plus, and this cumulative minus formula, and that's how we get each individual point on the chart. And really what it's saying is take take the current point, minus the, it from the target, and then divide it by the standard deviation. Um, the standard deviation is, you know, the average moving range uh, for the, if you're using individual points, or um, so that's that, uh, you know, range divided by a D2 factor or it's the average moving range for the subgroup means if you're using subgroups. But um, so basically how many standard deviations away are, is that point? And if it's above, or just to say outside of the K value you, uh, you chose, then you're gonna add that to the previous uh, cumulative sum value. And that will make you, you know, get more and more out of control. And then, uh, and then it does the opposite for the minus side. And then, um uh if it is if you were equal to your um your target so that be that delta value would be zero then um you would actually oh i'm sorry if you were right at that uh, 0.5 shift um then you would actually have uh your control char uh, charts would just show that uh c plus or c minus being flat because there'd be no change just be continuously just re reproducing the previous uh, C plus or C minus value. And if it's below that 0.5, then you'll actually start to trend that chart, that point back down to the target line. And if it ever starts to go negative, then it always just returns zero. So you'll, you'll see as a process becomes stable again, it comes back down to the, the, zero, the zero line. So go ahead and go to the next slide. And so here's some examples of just some diff the same data that we were looking at before, but I just tuned it some different ways just to kind of see how these these look. So the upper left hand side, it's a base chart. The the previous chart that we had looked at is actually the bottom right hand chart. And and uh, but in the upper left hand chart, I've split the difference. I just put it at the mean value. And since there the the process shifted from like around 100 up to 106, if we're just straight through the middle of that. You can see initially it starts to, it kind of starts to accumulate some deltas on the low side, and then we accumulate a little bit of deltas on the top side, but we actually never see anything get out of control um, because we're trying to find a half sigma shift. Our K is 0 0.5, and uh, and the shift we're talking about is like a uh, a quarter sigma shift on each side. So we we're not signaling that we would expect that. The right hand side is like, well, hey, let's just make the H value smaller and we still haven't signaled anything. You can see actually our ALR1 uh, decrease, which means that we're more sensitive to a one sigma shift, but our ALR0 is 59. So we're, we've actually destroyed our in process uh, alarming or in control process alarming. So that's you know tuned incorrectly. On the bottom left hand side, you can see that I changed, I put H back to five and I changed K to 0.1. So we actually now are detecting that 0.25 uh, sigma shift. But once again, our ALR, ARL of zero is 30. So we'd have to actually change our H value a little bit to try to tune that back to what we wanted to be uh, for the ARL zero. And then the right-hand side is, um, you know, when we set it to a target of 100 and, um, and, and we have our K value 0.5. And yeah, it signaled great, our ALR looks amazing at 465 for the uh, in control and uh, our AL1 is 10. So 
that's just some examples of kind of tuning and, and how the QSUM charts can, can uh, change. Uh, all right, next slide. So then we get to talk about exponentially weighted moving average. And same thing as QSUM in, in, in what it's trying to do. It's trying to detect small differences. And once again, this chart at the top, that's the same data that we were looking at before. So the right-hand chart is should look very familiar. The left-hand chart uh, is interesting from the standpoint with the default values, uh, the EWMA did not signal like the QSUM did. So this is just saying that the default values are more sensitive to smaller ships. Um, and once again, this is in the jump platform um, or jump software. And uh, But you can just... This chart can be tuned as well. You have the lambda factor, which is the main tuning. Um, and, and we'll see that in the formulas in the next slide. And then we'll, uh, and you have another factor for K that you can tune as well. But uh, it, the other interesting thing about EWA is that you, it'll formula allows you to actually predict the next data point. So it might be hard to see, um, but the very last data point in that upper left-hand chart is blue, and that's a forecasted point. So it's kind of cool that it'll give you kind of a heads up where it thinks the next point's going to be. Um, and I, I think initially it's a little easier to tune just because generally you can get away with just tuning the lambda parameter, not having to worry about the K factor. So there's just one less thing you have to deal with. And it's also more robust to non-normal data. So that might be one of the biggest um, the biggest things. Uh, but I actually think the, the best thing it has going for it is just, it is easier to interpret because you can see it is actually in data units on there. So, um, so it generally follows the shape of the curve. Uh, you know, it's just kind of a weighted, it's just a moving average in, in, in like the, the basis of it. So it'll like look like what your data looks like to a certain extent, depending on how much you weight it. And it's in the same data unit. So, um, you know, the next slide. And so this, so... Whereas our lower uh, control limit, upper control limit, the QSUM was whatever we want it to be, we get this fancy equation for EWA, and you know you can see the you know uh, the the part of the exponential uh, portion of the name in the actual control limits. Um, I did put a little chart. If you have a standard uh, uh, setting of k of equal to three, that's the default. So as we change lambda, you can kind of see what shift it's kind of targeting. So our 0.2 lambda that's a default is targeting a one standard deviation shift. So that, um, and then you can go down to a 0.05 and it's targeting a half uh, standard deviation shift. Uh, but the real fun is, yeah, this uh, EWA, EWMA uh, point. So this is what we're charting on the chart. And it has two forms. I like form one because it's easier for me to think about, but form two does have like show that uh, where the exponential is coming from, you know, it's raised to that J factor. Um, and so, but the form one, easier one to think about is just the current point times your lambda factor. So the default is 0.2. So 0.2 times the current point plus one minus 0.2, so 0.8 of the, the previous EWA point. So it's basically give me 20% of the current point and 80% of the past point, uh, the past uh, moving average point. And that's what you plot. And uh, if you actually go to a lambda of one, everything decomposes to actually just be uh, a shoe heart chart. So that uh, EWA point, the whole right hand side drops off because one minus one is zero. So we don't worry about that. And one times your current point is current point. And then as far as the control limits, everything underneath the square root uh, drops off. So it's just target plus and minus K times Sigma. So, Hey, shoe heart chart, we recognize you. Um, so that's kind of a, kind of an interesting, uh, you know, kind of an interesting bound of how, when you're tuning, you can go so far, they actually tune it in to just be a shoe heart chart, which you can see in the Lambda factor where it's the very, very last, uh, you know, number of standard deviations we're trying to detect is three for a Lambda of one. And that's, uh, what the shoe heart chart is really good at detecting a three Sigma shift. So uh, next slide, uh, here's just an example of the tuning for the uh, exponentially weighted uh, moving average charts. So uh, the upper left hand side is once again, it's the target is one of three. I've kind of split the difference between this lower process and upper process. And, you know, here you can actually see what the process looks like. So in the Q sum, we had the same thing. It, you know, we were looking at the cumulus sum of the delta. So the chart was, you know, didn't really show any character that was 
easily to inter easy to interpret by our, our human brains. Um, but here you can actually see that. So I think that's the real power of the EWA is is it is you can interpret what's going on uh, in the chart. Uh, I changed the lambda factor to the upper right hand chart just to tune it down to be really aggressive. Uh, and if you know it's kind of fun, you can see that that actually change changes the um, the control limits as well. Um, so you know that's part of that exponentially weighting uh, that goes into not only the points but the control limits. So uh, so unexpected, but you know once again very different from a Schuhart chart that has the static control limits. Uh, and you can see that we we didn't detect anything in this case. Um, our ARL zero is crazy high though, so that's great. But our ARL one did get worse than the default setting of 0.2. Uh, you know, it went from 10.84 to 13.5. Um, but once again, we didn't detect a shift, and that's to be expected. Our shift is around a quarter of a uh, standard deviation. The bottom left-hand panel, we're like, well, let's just try and inc or decrease K. So that actually really tightened up our control limits, you know, by a third. But once again, uh, and our ALR1 got really good. I mean, it reduced in half from our default, but our ALR, ARL0 once again, it's horrible. So um, in 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 uh, in the reference material, you'll see that for small shifts, it actually suggests you use a small lambda and a K of around like 2.8 seems to be kind of like the ticket uh, to, to tune these kind of charts in. And finally, I just showed an example of when I set lambda to one. Hey, there is a Schuhart chart. You can see our ALR zero is equal to 370 and our AL one is 44. So uh, next chart, just uh, showing all the same data, you know, just showing all three at the same time uh, and then showing the, the uh, ARL for the different shifts as well. Uh, you know, it's just kind of like the, the summary slide. If you wanted to keep one for reference, this is, a, this is a good one. But my suggestion, start with an EWA chart. Uh, it's easy to understand. It returns the control state quicker, which we'll see in the next slide. Um, and, uh, and like I said, I think it's a little easier to tune just right off the bat. Uh, QSum, QSum will respond faster if the process is swinging kind of across the process band. Um, so if you need to be really sensitive to that, that might be the way to go. But I would start with EWA and then see if that works for you. Also, if you're using QSum, uh, especially if you're using QSum, I would, would suggest that you show at, uh, your Schuhart chart as well because it's easier to interpret and you'll get the benefit of being able to look for shifts and trends. Uh, but also individual data points that could be out of control as well. So you really get the best of both worlds when you use the shoe, a shoe heart chart along with one of these um, methods. Uh, next slide. Uh, so finally, I just wanted to show a quick comparison on two kind of extreme values. So on the left-hand side there, the sample X. So the center chart on the left stack of charts is the raw data. Uh, the one above it is the EWA and the one below it is the QSUM. And so what's interesting, you can see that I put a line through. And, and so we went out of control on the positive side. And the EWA identified it. The QSUM identified it. But as we swung back and we actually ended up going out of control on the negative side, I put the line where the QSUM actually flagged that we went out of control on the negative side. And you can see that the EWA actually thinks at that period that we're nice and back in control. And it takes another eight data points until it flags to be uh, to be out of control on the low side. Um, so it responded faster to that swing across the band. Um, and it's and the bottom chart also really shows like the interpretability that can be a struggle with QSUM because when it goes out of control on the bottom the, the bottom side, it is still out of control on the top side. So that's always kind of fun when you're trying to talk to people when you're like, well, we're out of control on the bottom side. Ignore that we're out of control on the top side. Um, so so that's where, like I said, the QSUM can be a little, it's going to be more sensitive, but it can also be harder to interpret. Uh, uh, you know, the pressure test for a QSUM is this one on the right-hand side. So what I actually did is, uh, the once again, the raw data is um, in the center pan panel. The EWA is the top, QSUM is the bottom. Uh, so once it came back into control, I just manually changed all the data to be exactly on target. And you can see that the EWA, you know, 
basically shows what we expect. It also shows it coming back into control, um, which is great. Versus the Q sum is it looks really funky, right? I mean, it is just slowly inching its way back. And when we're the raw data says obviously we're back in control, the Q sum chart is giving you an alarm every single day that you're running this, which. And the problem is that the Q sum chart is, um, since we're exactly on target, uh, our delta is zero, so that left hand side disappears because it's the the individual point minus the target divided by standard deviation. So an individual point minus the target, it's on target zero. So so all we're doing is trying to slowly get back to zero by minusing 0.5 every single run. So it is going to take forever to get there. So in cases like this, you probably need to manually reset the chart at this point, or even build in like an algorithm that would look to uh, to manually reset the QSUM for you if you were, were building this out. Um, so that's just an extreme example of where the QSUM can you know fail, and the EWA actually did a pretty good job. So, all right, so that's all I have. So I'm going to hand it off to Karen to talk about the percentile method and the multivariate T-squares for individuals. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I'm going to... Uh continue and um, present the last two methods that we have here for this webinar. The first is a percentile control chart. So as you guessed it, it uses percentiles. The percentiles are used for the control limits and the center line. The lower control limit is the 0.135th percentile of the specific distribution that you're using for your data. The center line is the 50th percentile or the median, and the upper control limit is the 99.865th percentile of that same distribution. Now, when you would want to use this control chart is if your data is not normally distributed or when your data is not in time order. Sometimes you can't maintain that exact time order. Many of the control charts, the common use control charts, have the assumption that your data is in time order. If you see moving range, you know you are required to have time order data. So this method has a little bit more flexibility where um, that time order isn't going to impact um, the monitoring or the control of your process. So again, the benefits of using this, time order is not necessary, which um, well, to also reduce the quantity of false alarms. You'll be using the distribution that the data fits, and it can accommodate this skewed data. There are some characteristics, some um, parts, some characteristics, some processes that tend to have a skewed distribution, and it's not symmetrical. Many of the traditional or commonly used control charts assume a normal distribution, or at least symmetrical distribution. And this one also I like to use when the data is strictly positive. Now, some of the challenges is that, as Steve um, hinted earlier, that you have to calculate the control limits outside of the um, typical con you know, control charts and mini tab jump. It's very easy to calculate these control limits um, in Excel or in mini tab, but you'd be creating your own uh, control chart. And the other thing to, to know as well is that because we don't need time order, not all the Western electric rules are going to be applicable. Now, you can calculate equivalent rules to the Western electric rules, but again, the key is going to be whether or not the um, data is in time order. So next slide, please. Okay, so first, what is a percentile, right? since this is based on percentiles. So if you're familiar with the mean plus or minus three standard deviations or three sigma, you already know something about percentiles, right? So what percentiles are, are those X values where the area under the curve to the left of the line um, corresponds to what the X value is. So at the point one three fifth percentile to the left of that, you have 0.00135% of the uh, data or the area under the curve. The 99.865th percentile, you have 99.865% of the data under the curve. Now, if you think of those as goalposts in between, now we're at 99.73% of the data, right? And Steve already mentioned that number. The mean plus or minus three standard deviation is 99.73. You can use 
that same area under the curve, the 99.73, on many other continuous distributions. So the uh, curve on the right is for the Weibull distribution, and you could see that the, the distribution is skewed. It's got a long tail stretched out towards the right, but you're still able to calculate the same equivalent percentiles as you would in the normal world um, and still maintain that 99.73. Next slide, please. And this is where the benefit is. Here's a quick example. So like say, for example, um, your data, you're looking at a profile and you're, and you're measuring actuals, right? So the data is gonna be strictly positive. Profile data tends to be skewed. If you plotted this on an individual control chart, the Shuhar control chart, which assumes time order and assumes that the data is normally distributed, two things are gonna happen here. There's gonna be a blank space between zero and the lower control limit. So essentially you're saying, this process is going to produce negative values, which is impossible, right? For this particular feature, it's impossible to be negative. So you have all this blank space that um, that you get when you use the Shuhart uh, individual control chart. The other thing is you're getting a um, out of control point beyond the upper control limit, right? Now, if you go and you do your distribution fitting, you say, oh, this is a Weibull. It looks like that one curve on the previous slide. Um, it has to be strictly positive. We've got the skew. And if you see the two solid black lines now, the two percentile control limits, your process is in control. Now, this leads you to think, okay, well, is my process out of control or actually in control. I'm just changing the distribution. So the key when you're using the percentile method is that you need to know your process. You need to know your part and your characteristic. There are some characteristics that have a naturally skewed distribution. Not all characteristics are gonna be symmetrical and normally distributed, even with a large sample size. They just tend to have, you know, a Weibull or a gamma or a log normal distribution. So you need to know your data and how it's distributed, right? So you need to know if that skew is caused because the process is out of control or because this characteristic should fit this type of distribution. Okay, next slide, please. The last chart I'm going to talk about is the multivariate hoteling T squared chart for individuals. So this is um, a multivariate chart. It's a chart used for uh, variable data that shows how related var variables jointly affect a process. So this is the counterpart in the univariate world to the individual's control chart, okay? You want to use this chart when you want to simultaneously monitor two or more related variables. One thing to know that the underlying assumption is that the variables do have a multivariate normal distribution, right? So it is important for any control chart that you use, it's important to understand what the underlying assumptions are to make sure you're not violating them. Now, so what's the benefit for this? Because this is a little bit more complicated than the univariate case, um, is that you're using one control chart versus multiple control charts. If you have, you know, a half a dozen uh, related variables, instead of using six individual control charts, you can plot them on a single chart. Now, one of the downsides to that is that you're going to need to have some proficiency in multivariate statistics and matrix algebra. And the points that are plotted on the chart are more difficult to interpret than, say, the individual chart, only because they're in the quote unquote different units um, than what the actual measured value of the characteristic is. And then the other thing, which is related to about the um, multivariate statistics and matrix algebra, is if your um, control chart shows an out of point condition, you have to decompose the T squared to determine what the cause was. Now you will notice that there's only one control limit for this chart. You only have an upper control limit. I added the zero there, but you will not get a negative um, T squared value. And going to the next slide will help explain that. Okay, so what is T squared, big T squared? This is the hoteling multivariate T squared. Well, this is the multivariate counterpart to the student's T statistic. Oh, it looks like my, uh, oh, the um, formulas 
are slowly getting in here. Okay. So starting with the student statistic, the first uh, formula at the top there with little t, the numerator is the delta from the hypothesized mean, right? And that delta is divided by the standard error of the mean, right? So why do we divide this delta by the standard error of the mean? We use the student C statistic often in hypothesis testing, right? So what we want is a measure of significance that increases when the sample size increases and decreases when the variance increases, right? So you think about it. If you have a data set and you want to compare it to like another baseline data set, you're going to look at things like the mean, the variance, the sample size, right? So the student t statistic, the little t, does just that. Now, when you square the little t, the numerator now is, is a distance, right? You can rearrange the formula a little bit so it's on a single row. And now you can see easily how the univariate version corresponds or translate into the multivariate version, big T squared. So you replace X bar with the vector of the means. You replace the hypothesized mean, mu, with the vector of, hy of hypothesized means. And you replace the little s squared with the covariance matrix. So you are scaling, like you did with the little t, you're scaling this distance by the covariance matrix. This becomes a distance that you are plotting on the t-square chart um, for individuals. Now, you can have a t-square chart for individuals or subgroups. I just mentioned the individuals here. If you use the individuals, the x-bar is going to re be replaced by the individual value vectors, and then the mu the vector of the hypothesized means for each variable is going to be replaced by the x bar of the means. The only difference is when you're using the t squared for subgroups is the, the, the uh, calculation of t squared is slightly different and the control limit, the upper control limit. Again, there's one control limit um, has a different formula. Again, the T squared control charts, you're monitoring the distances. So you're only gonna have that one upper control limit. You can't be negative. So distances can be affected by a process drift. So say you have two variables that you are simultaneously monitoring on a T squared chart for individuals. And if they both move together, they drift together, the T squared chart will show that. Or if there's a change in the relationship between the variables, so say again, you have two variables and one is, you know, take for example, like an inner diameter and an outer diameter, like you're gonna plot those two on a T-square chart. If one of them remains, you know, pretty constant and consistent, but the other one changes very drastically, well, now you don't have that relationship anymore. And that's gonna show up on this chart as well. Again, when the T squared chart goes out of control, you're going to have to decompose T squared to determine what is the cause. So a little bit more math. However, the benefit, again, is that you only use one chart and you can see how the relationship between correlated or related variables um, is maintained for a process. OK, next slide, please. And that wraps it up for these five um, types of control charts. Again, Marnie presented the IMRR, the between within. This control chart is great when you have within subgroup and between subgroup variation. Steve talked about the QSUM and the EWMA. Both are able to detect small shifts in the mean. And um, they're more, the EWMA, for example, is more sensitive to recent process history, and you're able to forecast the next data point. 
I went over the percentile method, which is great when the data is not normally distributed or time order can't be maintained. And then we touched on the multivariate t squared for individuals. There are other um, multivariate control charts. Um, the generalized variance would be the equivalent to the moving range. There's a multivariate version of the EWMA. There's control charts based on principal components. So that's a whole nother area that you could dive into um, for data analysis. The next slide, we've put together a few references. Again, this is going to be published and um, on the on the website, and you'll be able to uh, use these links if you'd like to learn more about the methods that we discussed today. And with that, we have a few minutes left. We can um, take some questions and answers if you have any. Hey, Karen, it looks like in the chat uh, we had a question from Gabriel saying uh, the generalized variance control chart could be done with only one rational subgroup. So Gabrielle, can you elaborate a little bit more? And Gabriel, feel free at this point if you want to come off mute uh, to just ask the question. It doesn't have to stay in the chat box. So the uh, hotel in T square um, <laughs> could be uh, um, built with when you have one subgroup or more subgroups, right? But in the oh. case of the mm -hmm. so like a subgroup of one. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. But in the case of the generalized variance control chart. Could it also be the case for? Y yes. Yeah. Y yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you again. Um, like as we stated, it's going to be available online, the recording of the webinar, as well as the uh, presentation.